So um, welcome everyone to the Solidarity in Diversity, Highlighting Marginal Voices in Academia, Practice and Society Conference. This is the second annual conference of the University of Melbourne's African Study Group. Um, and it is a fabulous lineup for the whole week. And if you have not looked at the program, I would encourage you to do so. I'm Karen Farkerson. I am a professor of sociology here at the University of Melbourne. And before I get started, I uh, would like to acknowledge that I come to you from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, um, where I live and work. Everyone in Australia and in many other settler societies, it's very relevant to the talk we're going to have today, is on um, many of us on unceded indigenous land. Um, I'm on the unceded land of the Wurundjeri people. They never ceded their ownership of this land and I acknowledge their ongoing custodianship of the land that I live and work on for millennia and their ongoing struggle for justice. And I pay my respect to their elders past and present um, and any other um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are in the Zoom room today. Um, just before we get started as well, just a couple of Zoom room notes. Um, you can uh, introduce yourself in the chat if you would like to. We're not taking questions from the chat though, we're only taking questions through the Q&A function. So if you look at your Zoom screen, there's a Q&A thing at the bottom. Um, if you click on that, you'll have the opportunity to add a question and I'll go through the Q&A questions at the end after, after the, the talk. <clears throat> um, Professor Mamdani um, will speak for about an hour. We'll have a response for from um, Kennedy and Beva, um, and then we'll go into to question and answers. So I'm delighted to welcome Professor Mamadou, uh, Mahmoud Mamdani, who will speak on his recent book, Neither Settler Nor Native. Um, Mahmoud Mamdani is the Herbert Lehman Professor of Government in the Department of Anthropology and Political Science and the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University, where he was also director of the Institute of African Studies from 1999 to 2004. He received his PhD from Harvard University and specializes in the study of African history and politics. His works explore the intersection between politics and culture, um, a comparative study of colonialism since 1452, the history of civil war and genocide in Africa, the Cold War and the War on Terror, and the history and theory of human rights. Professor Mamdani has received numerous awards and recognitions, um, including being listed as one of the top 20 public intellectuals by Foreign Policy and Prospect Magazines in 2008. Um, and he has held all kinds of fabulous leadership positions. And um, in addition to from uh, neither settler nor native, Professor Mamdani's books include Saviors and Survivors, Dark World Politics and the War on Terror, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim, America, the Cold War and the Roots of Terror, and When Victims Become Killers, Colonialism, Nativism and Genocide in Rwanda. Um, so thank you for coming and giving our keynote today, Professor Mamdani, that's, it's really fabulous. Um, and then the person who's going to be giving a response to this keynote is Kennedy Liti Mbeva. Uh, Kennedy is currently a research fellow at the University of Melbourne at the Melbourne Sustainable Society in Institute. And he's the outgoing convener of the African Studies Group, which is the convener of this conference. He recently submitted his PhD thesis at the University of Melbourne. Um, where his research project examined the linkage politics of trade policy and global environmental governance. Prior to uh, commencing his doctoral studies, Kennedy has worked, studied, and lived in three continents, thus adopting a broad and nuanced worldview. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Professor Mamdani um, to give his keynote. And Kennedy and I will turn off our cameras. Mm, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference. Uh, the African Studies Group for inviting me to give this talk. I wish I, I could have visited uh, the University of Melbourne, but then I'm also aware that the current circumstances that compel us to resort to Zoom also allow for access without an arduous journey. Um, the distance between us is huge. I'm in Kampala, you are in Australia. In this talk, I'd like to provide an overview of my new book, Neither Settler Nor Native, The Making and Unmaking of Permanent Minorities. <clears throat> Neither Settler Nor Native is about the nation state and post-colonial modernity, excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> the introduction opens with a history of the two phases of the nation state. <clears throat> 
non-liberal and liberal. The nation state was born in Iberia in 1492. Its agenda was summed up by a single slogan, one country, one people, one religion. This project set fire to relations between majority and minorities within the boundaries of the state, setting in motion processes of ethnic cleansing, specifically of those who were said to belong to the wrong religion, Jews and Muslims. This was followed by a century of religious wars in Europe. I identify this as the first, the non-liberal phase in the making of the nation state. The liberal solution to religious wars <clears throat> was the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. <clears throat> Two key components of the modern state were born at Westphalia, religious toleration at home and the reciprocal guarantee of sovereignty abroad. It is John Locke who theorized the liberal solution in his treatise on tolerance, published in 1689. Catholics can be tolerated if they renounce any political support of the Pope or of any power outside England. This is how Locke formulated the key tenet of the liberal theory of the nation state. The liberal notion of the nation state turned majority and minority into permanent political identities. Only the majority has sovereignty. The minority must not participate in sovereignty. The notion of a sovereign majority alongside non-sovereign minorities was the original sin of liberal political theory. In neither settler nor native, I explore the export of the notion of different kinds of citizens, sovereign and non-sovereign, from the US to South Africa and Nazi Germany, and finally to Israel. At the same time, the book explores the construction of an epistemological project that grounded the political distinction between sovereign and non-sovereign subjects in a legal distinction. Beginning with religious groups, this distinction was extended to a civilizational one between races and tribes. I explore this development in some detail in the chapter on Sudan. Neither Settler Nor Native is a book about the United States as a founding experience in modern colonialism. <coughs> the first chapter explores the Indian reservation as the site where core institutions of modern colonialism were forged. It is also a book about extreme violence as a consequence of modern nation state building in the post colonies. Should we think of extreme violence as the consequence of a criminal project executed by individuals, no matter how numerous, along lines of the criminal model popularized by Nuremberg and today upheld by the ICC? Or should we think of it as a political project, a notion born of the transition from apartheid in South Africa? What can we learn from the failure of denazification and the relative success of post-apartheid South Africa. Finally, the book asks, what is transportable in the South African experience? What does South Africa have to teach us? To answer this question, the last chapter takes a fresh look, a look through South African lenses at Israel-Palestine, likely the most intractable political problem in today's world. In this talk, I'd like to comment on four issues. First, by taking the US as a case, I will compare the colonial conquest of Indians and the racial domination of Africans to distinguish between colonial conquest and racial domination as two different ways to subjugate, each with a radically different consequence. Second, I ask, what is the difference between an immigrant and a settler? Third, I suggest we think of two different ways of thinking of political identity as political and changing as opposed to natural and unchanging. To historicize identity is to see it as born of a particular form of the state and therefore as changeable, but to see it as the ground for a natural and permanent claim is to think of identity as a timeless expression of a trans-historical and innate cultural self. 
Finally, I suggest that we decouple the nation and the state as we seek an alternative to the nation state. <coughs> I shall begin with American Indians and African Americans. How should we call the pre-Columbian resident communities of the Americas? As Indian or as native? What's in the name? Indian is the name Columbus gave peoples of the new world. Today, we consider native a more politically correct designation. Yet, neither the US government nor the peoples they colonized accept the term native. The museum in Washington DC dedicated to pre-Columbian civilizations in the Americas is called the Museum of the American Indian. What difference would it make if we were to call it the Museum of the Native American? Why is it that the 1964 Civil Rights Act did not apply to Indians in reservations? So that a separate Indian Civil Rights Act had to be passed in 1968. To be sure, the two acts are not the same. The 1964 Act is constitutionally binding, whereas the 1968 Indian Act is not. It's only advisory. Reservation Indians are not and never have been rights-bearing citizens of the United States in a constitutional sense. There were no reservations before the US. The reservation was a creation of the United States. Though the reservation is geographically within the territory of the United States, it's a polity separate from the United States. The Europeans who came to America were not immigrants, they were settlers. What is the difference? Whether they seek equality or advantage, immigrants come to join existing polities. Settlers come to displace existing polities and establish their own exclusive sovereignty. Indian reservations are not part of the sovereign state we call the United States. The term Indian tribal sovereignty, another politically correct phrase, masks this reality of colonial domination. Legally, reservation Indians are wards of Congress. Reservation authorities are overseen by a vast federal bureaucracy known as the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The Bureau of Indian Affairs is no different from the colonial bureaucracy that governed any indirect rule colony in Africa. <clears throat> the Indian reservation was part of a two-state solution. The two-state solution, a sovereign state alongside a non-sovereign protectorate, was Lincoln's contribution in the second half of the 19th century. It claimed to provide a permanent solution for Indians who had survived the genocide. Germany also embraced a two-state solution after Nuremberg. Instead of reintegrating Jews as equal citizens in a single state as part of a one-state solution, post-Holocaust Germany embraced the idea of a separate state for Jews. As a result, even if the Nazi project was defeated militarily, it survived politically. The two-state solution gave the Nazi project a longer political lease. The latest version of the two-state solution is in Israel-Palestine. In contrast to South Africa, where the population was subordinated, majority of the population in Israel was expelled outside its boundaries, as it had been in the US when Indians were herded into reservations. America also originated the notion of differentiated citizenship, with only some participating in sovereignty. Until 1921, Indians were nationals, but not citizens. After that, Indians had first to be purged as members of Indian polities before they could be naturalized as US citizens, individually naturalized. Colonized Indians and African slaves represent two different colonial solutions. Both were turned into minorities, one inside the state, the other outside it. One was sustained by colonial conquest, the other by racial domination. The consequences have been radically different. Racial and colonial domination are not the same, even if racial discrimination is common to both. Reservation Indians have a different relationship to the US from that of African Americans. <clears throat> 
colonization refers to the conquest of territory. The American Indian symbolized land which has been stolen. The African slave embodied captive and coarse labor. The one state solution provided a political frame for the development of the struggle against Jim Crow and racial domination. Even if it proceeded by fits and starts, even receding at times, the one state framework both underlined the necessity of developing alliances and made it possible. The two state solution explains both the continued isolation of the reservation Indian through colonization and their ongoing fragmentation as a people. The radical difference in the political effect of each solution is clear from the American case. The one state solution has provided a political context for alliance building in a general emancipatory struggle. In contrast, a two state solution has imposed isolation on an oppressed group by imposing on it a separate political home, a protectorate, and compounded that isolation with ongoing fragmentation in multiple reservations. I conclude that a one state solution is politically preferable to a two state solution. The American model was exported to a number of places, among these South Africa, Germany, and Israel. South African settlers attained state independence in 1910. A delegation visited North America, USA, and Canada for two years later to study how Indians were governed. Three key elements of governance were imported to South Africa, homeland, traditional authority, and customary law. The starting fiction was that every tribe has from time immemorial lived in a territorially contained homeland. The fiction of a homeland in reality must a program to expel each tribe from the bulk of its historical lands. Second, Every homeland was said to have been administered by traditional authority, also said to be from time immemorial. Eternally sanctioned by custom, this authority was said to be customary, meaning not elected. Third, this traditional authority claimed the right to enforce a customary law on the homeland. Custom too was said to have been there from time immemorial. This time though, settlers insisted that custom be excised of all practices or notions that settlers considered repugnant to civilization. I will return to discussing the lessons of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa after a discussion of Germany and Israel. <coughs> South Africa was not the only one that learned from the US. So did Nazi Germany and Hitler. Hitler drew two lessons from the US. The first was that genocide is doable and therefore thinkable. The second was that it's possible to create a second and a third class citizenship as of African-Americans, Indian citizens after 1921, later Puerto Ricans in the US. Hitler appointed a committee of lawyers to study American citizenship laws. This background preparation led to the drafting of Nuremberg laws. The learning process has been documented by James Q. Whitman of Yale University in his book, Hitler's American Model. I argued that post-war denazification failed because the allies shut their eyes to the political project that inspired and propelled Nazism. Nazism was a striving for a purified nation state, one that would go beyond distinguishing the national majority from national minorities to purifying the nation by expunging it of all minorities. After the Second World War, there was an American debate on Nazism. Was Germany liberated or occupied? Was Nazism a state project or a social project? Who should be held responsible for Nazism? The nation or the state? Nazi leaders or the German people? The American consensus was that the responsibility for Nazism lay with the German people. At Nuremberg and after, millions were considered criminally culpable, though each one individually. Yet Nazism was never probed as a political project. A similar debate unfolded inside Germany, particularly among German left intellectuals, 
the most prominent being Franz Neumann and Herbert Marcuse. Neumann wrote Behemoth, a book that dissected National Socialism. His answer, Nazism was neither just a state project nor just a project of German society. Nazism was rather a nation state project, a project of both the Nazi state and the German folk to eradicate the presence of national minorities, Jews, Roma, and others from state territory. From this point of view, Nazism was above all a political project. Denazification would thus require an alliance of all anti-Nazi forces, external and internal, the allies in those sections of German society that had resisted Nazism. But Americans were unwilling to do so. Only the Soviets were willing in the East, but only temporarily and not after the Berlin uprising. I argued that Nuremberg failed to root out Nazism politically. To understand why I distinguish the criminal model, which understands violence as the result of antisocial acts of individual perpetrators, from the political model, which sees extreme violence as a result of group mobilization around the collective nation state project. Rather than individualized violence as a standalone act, I point to cycles of violence sustained by groups mobilized as so many constituencies. Rather than catalog atrocities so as to name, shame, and punish individual perpetrators, I seek to identify the issues around which constituencies were mobilized. More importantly, rather than exclude perpetrators from the political process, I seek to include them along with all those who survived, victims, perpetrators, beneficiaries, bystanders. I use the term survivor differently from how it was used after the Holocaust or after the Rwandan genocide, not just to refer to surviving victims of extreme violence, but to all who survived the catastrophe we know as extreme violence. The point is to try and stop the cycle of violence by shifting attention from perpetrators to the issues that drive the violence. Let me return to the nation state project and its development from a non-liberal to a liberal project. As I've already suggested, political liberalism unfolded as part of a counterinsurgency project, not only in Europe after Westphalia, but also in the colonies. Neither settler nor native pursues this line of inquiry as part of a detailed case study of race and tribe making in Sudan after its colonization by Britain. The late 19th century Mahdiya in the Sudan was one of three events that shook the foundations of the British Empire between mid and end 19th century. The others were the Indian uprising of 1857 and the Morant Bay Rebellion in the West Indies a decade later. The subsequent imperial reform was led by Henry Maine, a member of the Viceroy's Legal Commission in India, who argued that the Indian uprising was the result of quote, an epistemic defect. Maine called for an epistemic, epistemic rethink that would both anchor the colonial project in a reshaped understanding of custom and fractured the colonize into smaller groups, each claiming a longer and thus authentic history. I examined this project in the context of Britain's reformed governance as it unfolded in two steps following the imperial defeat of the Mahdiya. The first step divided the population into two major blocks, each identified as a separate race, one Arab and the other African. In Sudan, the language of race begins with colonialism. The second step was to divide each race into several tribes. Even if tribe may previously have designated a distinct cultural group, an ethnic group in the language of anthropologists, it now became the basis of several connected claims, a separate homeland, a traditional authority enforcing its customary law. The Sudanese anti-colonial movement embraced these claims as if they were natural. The anti-colonial movement needs to be understood as more of a derivative than a creative act. From the start, the anti-colonial movement presented itself 
as a national movement. Embracing the language of nation, all colonialists describe their struggle as nationalist, their object being to set up their own nation through an act of national self-determination. The question thus arose, who was the nation? Who was the self in self-determination? Was the nation Arab? Was it Islamic or was it African? These three definitions of the nation sum up the three phases in the nationalist movement that followed state independence in 1954. The person who came closest to breaking through the nationalist mythology was John Garang, who argued that Sudan was both Arab and African, that Arabic was a language and Africa a place. You could thus be both Arab and African. He called for a new Sudan, a state that would acknowledge Arabs and Africans as among its citizens. Garang's political project seemed to die with Garang when he was murdered. Those who replaced him in the SPLA called for the division of Sudan into two homelands, one for Arabs, the other for Africans. Backed up by a coalition of Western states, led by the Trotka, by the Troika, the US, Britain, and Norway, the project gave birth to an independent South Sudan, which in no time disintegrated as different tribal militias fought over the spoils which included cabinet positions, ministries, even districts, even claiming the right to its own tribal homeland in a South Sudan that should rightfully be a federation of tribes. In less than two years, the tribal coalition fell apart and a tribal war followed in 2013. Faced with this unanticipated catastrophe in the short aftermath of a much celebrated independence, the African Union set up an independent five-person commission of inquiry. The commission produced two reports. The majority report reproduced the logic of Nuremberg and cozied up to the ICC, the International Criminal Court. It denounced the violence as criminal and demanded that individuals be held responsible for it. As always with the discourse of criminal justice, the assumption was that the state cannot commit a crime. Only individuals in the state can. I authored the minority report and suggested we think of the violence as political and thus look for a solution by calling for the reform of the state based on a project other than that of creating a nation state. Let me come to Israel. Are Jewish people in Israel settlers or immigrants? the Jewish population of Mandate Palestine belonged to three groups. First were those who had never left the land of Palestine. They were among the natives of Palestine. Second were those who returned to the Holy Land on a pilgrimage seeking a religious homeland. They were contempt to be part of the existing polity. This group were known as the first Aliyah. They were immigrants. Then followed those in the second and the third Aliyah they looked to create their own extensive exclusive polity, a Jewish nation state in place of the existing polity. These are the settlers. The Zionists drew a lesson from Germany. Victims of the nation state project in Germany and in Europe, Zionists decided to set up a nation state in Eretz Israel. The Zionist state project unfolded in two phases. The first reduced Palestinians from a majority to a minority. This catastrophic expulsion is known as the Nakba. The Zionist project has continued to demonize the minority that remained within its territorial boundaries as a demographic threat whose numbers must be cut down. In other words, the Nakba continues. Palestinians inside Israel do not participate in sovereignty. They have rights, even political rights, including the right to vote, but they do not participate in power. This vision has become clearer as the state project has been redefined from Israel as a Jewish and democratic state to Israel as a Jewish state. In this context, Palestinians face two options, a one state solution where they would face racial exclusion, <coughs> including political marginalization, but within the same state. In contrast, the two-state solution would create a protectorate and lead to indirect colonialism under Zionist rule. 
Neither settler nor native argues that a one state solution will provide a better framework for building alliances for a durable resistance. Second, I argue that resistance is not enough. One also needs the vision of a different future. I propose that we look at the South African transition from apartheid for a glimpse of a third alternative. A different vision emerged in South Africa in the 1970s. Before the 1970s, anti-apartheid politics was largely derivative. By uncritically embracing the architecture of apartheid, the resistance reproduced it. Each racial group organized separately as defined by apartheid power. Africans as ANC, Indians as Indian Congress of Natal, coloreds as Colored People's Congress, and whites as Congress of Democrats. Apartheid's ideological hold was not broken until the 1970s. The key initiative came from the student movement, white and black. The starting point was after black students under Biko left the liberal white student organization, formed their own separate body and went on to organize township dwellers, starting with Soweto. Radical white lefts, white students left in the wilderness turned to organizing hostile workers on the fringes of these same townships. The turning point in anti-apartheid politics was not the armed struggle, but the strikes that began in Durban in 1973 and the uprising in Soweto in 1976. The Soweto uprising unfolded under the banner of black consciousness. B Biko said, black is not a color. If you're oppressed, you're black. The important thing is to recognize that there was nothing inevitable about the impact of black consciousness on the anti-apartheid struggle. BC could have led to a nation state consciousness, claiming that South Africa is a black nation of the black majority, thus essentializing black as a trans-historical identity. Instead, it led to an epistemological awakening, the consciousness of black as a historical political identity. Afrikaners made a journey from being junior partners of British colonialism to being part of the anti-apartheid coalition. Even here, there was no consensus. The rift inside the Afrikaner community was demonstrated by the publication of a book authored by Rian Malan, the great grandson of a Boer state president. The book was called My Traitor's Heart. Malan was a crime reporter for the Johannesburg Star. His beat covered black townships. <clears throat> Each chapter of his book focused on a specific type of what was then called black on black violence. One chapter was devoted to the hammer man, a big black man who wielded a heavy hammer to smash the skulls of his victims, all equally black but all poor people who would yield small pits. Malan's subtext was, subtext was not difficult to decipher. If they can do this to their own, what will they do to us if given half a chance? The South African moment was born in the 70s and 80s. This birth was marked by a threefold shift in vision. From opposition to apartheid, they looked for an alternative to apartheid. Rather than being content with turning the world upside down, they dared to think of a different world. From a state of the majority, the national majority, the black majority, the resistance began looking to create a state of all the people. From opposition to whites, the resistance went on to oppose white power. I suggest we think of 1994 as marking the birth of a new political community. The alternative would have been to rupture the existing community into two separate ones, as in Sudan, one for victims, the other for perpetrators, one for blacks, the other for whites, requiring a partition of South Africa as of South Sudan. Let us not forget that in 1994, Afrikaners were divided about the future with a minority asking for a homeland where Afrikaners would have their own state. The anti-apartheid movement chose a different future, a common future for survivors of apartheid, who they often described as a rainbow, not just victims who survived, but all who survived, whether victims, perpetrators, beneficiaries, or bystanders. <laughs>
The principal critique of 1994 is that there was no social justice. The critique both states a truism and misses the significance of the political rebirth. That was 1994. I argue that we should see the rebirth as the beginning of political decolonization. The turning point was the reformulation of the central demand from black majority rule to non-racial rule. Rather than deny the existence of race as phenotypical difference, they refused to endow racial difference with a political significance. The first step to decolonizing the political was deracialization. The next step would be detribalization. Rather than deny the cultural significance of tribes as an ethnic group, detribalization would couple the link forged under colonialism between culture and territory, ethnicity and homeland. To do so would reverse the process whereby colonialism and apartheid politicize culture through the creation of homelands, whereby a homeland authority would enforce a customary law the result would be a single citizenship, not multiple citizenships based on separate identifications, race in the central state and tribe in the homelands. 1994 created formal political equality in South Africa, regardless of race, but it has yet to create formal political equality in the formal homelands, regardless of ethnic identity. My claim is that a successful struggle for social justice will need to cut across the political divide imposed by race and tribe. Without political equality, the mobilization for social justice will be fragmented into so many races and tribes. It will more likely lead to an internal civil war. The result will stink, like the 1994 genocide in Rwanda, or its mini version, the ongoing xenophobic violence in South Africa. Let me conclude with Israel-Palestine. At the core of political Zionism is a political project to build not just a Jewish religious community in the Holy Land, but a Jewish state. Political Zionism seeks to erase the distinction between state and society. The conflation of society with state is the foundation of the nation state and its program of rule by a permanent national majority. The nation state may call itself a democracy as Israel does, but this majority is not actually determined through political contestation. Rather, the majority is defined pre-politically as in the nation. The most the majority can hope for is a democracy for the majority, but not for all. But even majoritarian democracy remains a difficult project in Israel because the state defines who can be a member of that majority. In other words, who is officially recognized as a Jew? If Israel is to be a state for Jews only, it must answer the question of who is a Jew. Its answer cannot avoid flattening the diversity of world Jewry into the Jewry sanctioned by the state. At the legal level, this question has bedeviled Israeli authorities since the law of return was passed in 1950. Is a Jew defined by religion or by ethnicity or both? The state of Israel has two legal definitions of who is a Jew. The narrow definition provided by the halacha law, the religious law, which Israel enforces in the sphere of personal affairs and the broad definition in the amended law of return. At the political and social level, Judaization eliminates unacceptable forms of Jewishness. The acceptable form is associated with Ashkenazim, European Jews who traced their lineage to Yiddish speaking parts of Europe. Ashkenazim were the founders of the state who claimed to be civilizers committed to bring other Jews into line with the national ideal. In particular, Ashkenazim have sought to civilize Mizrahim. The Mizrahim are Arab Jews. They present a special challenge to Zionism for Zionism presumes that Arab and Jewish identity are both incompatible and indelibly hostile toward one another. Otherwise, there would be no need of a Jewish state in historic Palestine. Ashkenazi Israel has demanded of the Mizrahim that they denounce their Arab culture 
and embrace only their religion, Judaism. After several decades, the Mizrahim have paid back by standing behind a stark religious Zionism that has two targets, the Ashkenazim and the Palestinians. <clears throat> In the Zionist worldview, Palestinians are Canaanites who never left home. They are squatters, not natives. The Zionist demand is that after the Holocaust, the squatter must make room for the returning native and get out of the way. The development of a Palestinian consciousness straddling these three groups has been an outcome of a protracted process whose focus and center of gravity have shifted radically over time from exile to home and from an all or nothing demand from Israel's disintegration to a demand for involvement in the Israeli political process. Organizationally, this has involved a threefold transition. Excuse me. <coughs> At first, displaced Palestinians looked to Arab frontline states to be their protectors and liberators. After these Arab states were defeated in 1957, Palestinians turned to the nascent and exile-led PLO, an armed resistance movement. In 1982, Israel went to war in Lebanon. The brainchild of Ariel Sharon, then the defense minister, this was a total war against Palestinians. The IDF deployed well over 120,000 troops for over 10 weeks. It was the country's largest mobilization since the 1973 war, according to Rashid Khalidi, the leading Palestinian historian. Outgunned and overwhelmed, the PLO withdrew to Tunis. Even if the PLO was defeated, Sharon's strategic objective remained unrealized. Instead, the war intended to suppress Palestinian nationalism only stoked it further. With the exiled armed resistance smashed, the moment was ripe for political mobilization at home. The first intifada in the late 1980s crystallized the internalization of Palestinian leadership, and with it, a definitive rejection of the failed armed resistance championed by the external leadership with a mainly refugee base. The second intifada beginning in 2000 brought together Palestinians in Israel and the occupied territories under a single movement. Both intifadas responded to the failings of the official Palestinian liberation movement. The second intifada in particular reflected frustration over the PLO's capitulation to Zionism as the Oslo Accords of 1993 and the onward rush of settlements that followed it. Arafat made two crucial compromises at Oslo. First, he tacitly accepted settlements in the West Bank. Second, he explicitly accepted Israel's stranglehold over the economy and sovereignty of the occupied territories, even going as far as to agree that this stranglehold would persist in a future Palestinian state. The success of the Second Intifada led to mobilization under Balad, National Democratic Alliance, a political party led at the time by Azmi Bishara, a Palestinian MK. Bishara and Balad's contribution can be summed up in two bills he introduced in the Knesset over the years. The first was a new basic law calling for collective rights and complete civic equality, but not political equality of the minority and the majority. This first bill was still within the framework of a nation state politics, accepting the distinction between the majority nation and its minorities. The second bill went a step further. It asked the Knesset to affirm that Israel is a state of all its citizens, whereas Bishara's first bill sought equal rights for the national minority. Now he was asking the Knesset explicitly to reject the idea that Israel is a nation state a state of the Jewish people, thereby negating the existence of both the national minority and the national majority. Over the past decade, Palestinian politics has moved from an engagement predominantly internal to one predominantly external. The internal engagement called for a state of all its citizens as a counter to the Zionist project for a Jewish state. The external engagement takes the form of an international boycott of the Israeli state and society under BDS. <clears throat> 
to the extent that BDS calls for the designization of the state of Israel, there is reason to give it full and enthusiastic support. But to the extent that BDS seeks to extend this boycott to Israeli society and not just to its Zionist sectors, there is reason for caution. BDS needs to learn from the very experience it claims to build on. That is the South African divestment and boycott during apartheid. As a participant in the anti-apartheid boycott, I came to realize that its key mistake was to collapse state regime and society into a seamless whole. The main problem with blanket boycotts is that they embrace a mirror image of the nation state framework, which collapses state and society into one. By themselves, international boycotts are incomplete. The strategy of isolating the state internationally needs to be aligned with a domestic strategy to isolate the forces that stand behind the state project internally. To drive a wedge between pro-state forces in Israeli society, in civil society, and those not aligned to the state. For Palestinians and Israelis, both those anti-Zionist and non-Zionist, the South African struggle offers two lessons in Israel as in South Africa. This means overcoming two categories of divisions. The first is the division between victims of the nation state. In South Africa, the population was divided among township dwellers and Bantustan residents, a barrier overcome by a coalition of students and workers. The victimized population was also divided racially and tribally. The racial barrier was overcome by the black consciousness movement while the tribal barrier remains. Among the Palestinians, there's a tripartite division of victims, those living in the diaspora, the occupied territories, and Israel proper. Each of these groups has been further differentiated. The diaspora includes those in the refugee camps and those beyond. Residents of the occupied territories are split between the West Bank and Gaza. And oppressed citizens of Israel include Arabs, Druze, and Bedouin. Each microgroup is subject to a different political regime designed to produce a specific and separate subjectivity. The second phase in South Africa led to winning over a sizable number of apartheid supporters to the anti apartheid cause. That may be harder in Israel. That said, we cannot forget that the ground shifted from under the apartheid state when Afrikaners, who provided most of the foot soldiers for apartheid's machinery, machinery of repression, opened up to an alternative to the apartheid order. The Afrikaner shift from the right of the political spectrum to its middle range shows that no political identity is permanent. What can BDS learn from the South African experience? First, Whereas BDS can contribute to Israel's international isolation, something else is needed if a non-Zionist alternative is to bloom in Israel itself. Like in South Africa, that something else is an epistemic revolution that will open the way to a political one. The Palestinian moment will come when the resistance recognizes the complementarity of two seemingly different objectives, to unify the oppressed and to fragment their opposition so as to isolate the core opponents. The goal should be to arrive at a point whereby it is not just the oppressed who seek political change, but also many of the current supporters of Zionist power. Getting there will require a new kind of political consciousness within Israel, a consciousness based on a double recognition that there can be no military solution to the Palestine-Israel question and that the flourishing of Jews and Jewish life does not require a Zionist state. Apartheid fell because of a confluence of two developments. The better known of these is the anti-apartheid uprising in the townships. The uprising brought diverse groups under a single umbrella. The result was not a victory, but a deadlock. Why then did the National Party choose to go to the negotiating table? to shift focus from a military to a political struggle, because the NP realized that it was beginning to lose the support of important sections of the Boer intelligentsia, which were calling for a political solution to the problem of apartheid. The writing was on the wall. More and more of this intelligentsia were convinced 
that whites did not need to monopolize political power to have a home in South Africa. It is this lesson that needs to be driven home to Israelis, as many as possible, that Jews do not need to have a Jewish state to have a secure home in Israel, Palestine. Indeed, Jews are more secure in New York City than they are in Israel. The lesson for BDS is that they need to build on the gains made by Balad. To do so would be to provide a political home to anti-Zionist and even non-Zionist Jews in Israel. Thank you. Thank you. That was an absolutely fabulous talk. And, um, uh, and, it, and for those who have not read the book, it is an absolutely fabulous book. Um, I'm going to invite Kennedy now to give a brief response. Kennedy? Great, thank you a lot, uh, Professor Mamdani, for the very stimulating uh, lecture, and Professor Ferguson for the floor. Uh, I'll start by prefacing my comments uh, with uh, the, my overall uh, um, feeling uh, or view of the lecture. And it's quite interesting because uh, the topic that it picks um, shines a spotlight on what I'd say is hidden in plain sight. Uh, Post-colonial and settler states are everywhere that we see. So this book and the lecture uh, is quite refreshing in the sense that it returns the spotlight uh, to these states and uh, the legacies of these states that we continue to grapple with. So my first uh, set of feedback uh, or remarks uh, would be uh, highlighting uh, the key points of the lecture from my view. And the first uh, point uh, that has struck me is the redefining of political decolonization. Uh, in most cases, we usually view uh, political decolonization from the inside out. Uh, where we look at the nation state vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, the international environment or other external actors and the need to reframe or uh, such relations. But uh, the lecture has drawn a very sharp, uh, shown a very sharp spotlight within the nation state uh, and the settler states. And so within those borders of these kinds of states, uh, trying to look at uh, some of the uh, political dynamics and challenges and the legacies of uh, the creation of those kinds of states. A second point uh, that I took uh, from the lecture was how law uh, in the domestic sense was used as a technology in shaping the state, uh, be it in designating majority or minority groups, but also uh, deciding on who has uh, rights such as citizenship or first, uh, second and third class uh, citizenship. That draws attention to the very potent uh, role of a law as a technology. And uh, it calls upon us to rethink how the legal systems in these kinds of states and others uh, work to promote or undermine certain interests. So having said say that, I move to my second set of remarks, uh, which uh, sort of seek to stimulate further reflections uh, on the points raised by Professor Mandani. And the first one I'd like to talk about is decoupling the nation and the state. It's a very striking uh, suggestion uh, because if you think about it in most times, uh, as Professor Mamdani put it, the nation and the state made each other and they're quite tied at the hip. And if that is the case, then uh, the task of decoupling the two uh, is quite significant. But then one would uh, raise a couple of uh, issues or points uh, that. Uh, because the, if the objective of decoupling the nation and the state is to do away with the vicious dynamics of the minority and the majority, and instead have a democracy uh, that would uh, form the nation, then uh, it will be really interesting to hear Professor Mamdani's reflection on that uh, line of argument vis-a-vis -vis what we nowadays call identity politics. Because on the one hand, there are those who say the different groups that we have uh, in uh, society are good uh, because they advance different viewpoints, hence democracy. But then uh, we've seen the politicization of such groups recently and uh, they bring about uh, fragmentation or even undermine uh, the broader project uh, of the nation uh, broadly defined. My second point uh, on, uh, for further reflection is on the 
uh, significance of the international dimension in the political decolonization project. On the one hand, we've seen the negative dynamics, uh, for example, the United States uh, settler model being an inspiration to uh, some of the other political projects such as Nazism and the apartheid uh, system in South Africa, which uh, um, have, a very, um, have had a very detrimental effect. But on the other hand, we've seen uh, positive uh, effects of the international dimension where different groups have mobilized, uh, especially uh, in the South African case, uh, to try and support the domestic groups that try to, uh, uh, to proceed with political decolonization. So what is then uh, the significance of what Professor Mondani calls uh, epistemic revolution? Uh, the inspiration from the South African case where black consciousness was used as an organizing logic to bring together the various groups is quite inspiring, but could we have a global uh, consciousness uh, around these issues, especially given the recent uh, uh, protests across the world on issues such as racism, Black Lives Matter, uh, etc. Uh, are we, uh, can we realize such a kind of global consciousness? My third point uh, on uh, calling for further reflection is on the feasibility of the project of political decolonization. On the one hand, uh, it sounds very da daunting, uh, sort of uh, changing uh, the domestic political dynamics. Uh, for example, uh, depoliticizing uh, identities such as ethnicity, as yes, that has been the root cause of problems, especially in uh, post-colonial states, or even deracializing uh, settler states. The South African model, as Professor Mamdani notes, offers inspiration, uh, if not, uh, motivation uh, for what is possible, uh, decolonize, political decolonization and having the different uh, groups that were antagonists being survivors, but also uh, cases such as uh, Sudan, South Sudan, which uh, given uh, the diagnosis by Professor Mamdani, uh, one uh, would really try very hard to get any hope uh, that that system would work uh, given that uh, uh, John Garang's vision of a new Sudan was not realized, but instead what we have is a state beset by challenges, especially the politicization of the different kinds of ethnicities. So do, should we, do, will we see more South African models? So in concluding uh, my remarks, I'd like to uh, reflect, uh, use Professor Mamdani's lecture uh, to reflect on the broader theme of this conference, which is solidarity in diversity. And in an earlier session today, we had a debate uh, which centered on the motion, uh, solidarity in diversity is a mirage. So given the task of political decolonization as laid out by Professor Mamdani, uh, should we have hope that in all this diversity uh, that we have and which can underpin uh, pulling together to try and realize the objectives of political decolonization, how uh, does solidarity uh, play a role in helping to realize that. So this lecture in a broader context helps to stim stimulate the conversation along those lines. And it's, uh, it's timing could not have been better in setting the overall theme and tempo of the conference. So I'll conclude my remarks uh, on that point and yield the floor back to Professor Fakosi. Thank you. Thank you, Kennedy. That was a, a very good response. Um, Professor Mambani, uh, would you like to uh, respond to Kennedy. Sure. Um, thank you very much uh, to, to Kennedy. Uh, I think this is a this is an excellent response, uh, which which gets to the heart of of what I'm talking about. Uh, both the question of uh, uh, the meaning of. Uh, a political decolonization um, and to the question of uh, what we call identity politics, uh, the relationship between politics and culture. Um, let me begin where Kennedy ended. Uh, is solidarity in diversity a mirage? Depends what kind of diversity are we talking about and what kind of solidarity are we talking about? 
are we talking of creating in the midst of cultural diversity, a cultural solidarity? In other words, sameness? If so, that's a mirage. But I'm not talking of that. For me, if we're talking of solidarity and diversity, and I'm not part of this conversation, I haven't been part of this conversation in this conference before my talk, but I'm talking of political solidarity in the midst of cultural diversity, not creating a cultural sameness, which would blur the distinction between different cultural groups but creating a political solidarity around political issues, which do not observe the same boundaries as defined the identity, the cultural identity of different groups. Now, of course, there's always a problem uh, of discussing a project that hasn't been realized. Uh, either an unfinished project or a project that a scholar tries to deem uh, by reflecting on an ongoing social and political process. Uh, I, I say in the book that uh, I do not see myself as a conventional political theorist uh, because conventional political theorists try to answer the question, what is a good society? Conventional political theorists believe that a professor in his or her own study can produce the blueprint of a good society. I don't believe that. I don't believe it at all. I believe that if we are to produce a blueprint of a good society, our starting point has to be not intellectual reflection, but actual social and political struggles on the ground. I believe that the raw material of intellectual reflection or intellectual reflection has to draw its raw material from real life with the full recognition that political and social movements in real life do not give us an answer because they are necessarily and inherently contradictory, but they do provide us the raw material. And the task of an intellectual of a scholar is to work this raw material into a reflection which provides a degree of consistency. So of course, this project that I'm talking about of political decolonization has not been realized anywhere. It has not been realized in South Africa but you can see the beginnings of it. You can see the beginnings of it in simply the fact that we did not move from apartheid, minority racial rule to majority racial rule. We did not move from white rule to black rule. We did not move from the rule by a minority defined in national terms to a rule by a majority defined in national terms. The majority that rules is not a national majority. It's a political majority. That's the bright side. The downside of the South African example 
is that apartheid was not simply a racial project. Apartheid did not simply bring together those defined as whites. <clears throat> because remember, apartheid was a democratic project in the sense that the national party was elected regularly by a white electorate. But that would not be enough. The other side of apartheid was that it also tribalized the majority black population. And it's detribalization which remains the huge challenge for post-apartheid South Africa. Well, the news of the last week, what's happening in, in, in KwaZulu-Natal and in, uh, and in uh, uh, the hostile areas in Gauteng. That should drive the point home. The fact that uh, Jacob Zuma is being seen not simply as a political leader who needs to be held accountable for his misdeeds, but he's being seen as a Zulu leader who's jailing represents the marginalization of the Zulu people in the national political community. Why should people see it like that? It's raw material for us to think through. Finally, I want to say that uh, Kennedy is quite right. But before I go to that, finally, just, just let me sum this up, which is I am asking us to think culture and politics differently. And I am asking us to think not the plurality of culture as the problem, but the politicization of culture as the problem. Culture and politics are different in this sense. Politics is state politics is necessarily territorial. Sovereignty is necessarily territorial. The nation state is necessarily territorial. Culture is not territorial. Culture overflows political boundaries. Culture is diasporic can be diasporic. One comment about Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, the upside is the global consciousness it has triggered. But the downside to me is I am astounded that the consciousness of race and the need to be racialized is so far ahead of any consciousness of the US as a settler colonial state. Even Black Lives Matter has not embraced, it has embraced in some statements, but as a mobilizational movement, it has yet to embrace the Indian question in the US, in North America, in the Americas, in Australia, New Zealand, all these places. Um, so we're still behind. Finally, depoliticization. Uh, Kennedy is quite right that the conventional understanding of, of uh, not depoliticization, but, but political decolonization was always with reference to the international community. The social was understood as internal and the political was understood as achieving sovereignty, uh, achieving a formal equality with the international community of nation states. 
uh, I'm asking us to think of political colonization is not simply the imposition of a colonial sovereignty on a local community, but it's complete internal reorganization of that local community um, along lines of race, tribe, religion, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have uh, some questions from the audience. So the first question from the audience is from Susanna, who Susanna says, um, thank you, I cannot wait to read your book. She says, my question relates to decolonization and statehood relating to indigenous and settler law and sovereignty in the settler colonial nation state specifically. And she asks, is there an epistemic relationship between ideology and the construction of the modern nation state? And if so, can statehood be a productive conduit through which settler colonial decolonization can occur? Or should it ultimately be done away with? Say that again. Is there an epistemic relationship between ideology and? The construction of the modern nation state. And if so, can statehood be a productive conduit through which settler colonial decolonization can occur? Can statehood be a productive conduit through which settler colonial decolonization can occur? If, if the last part of your question means, uh, should settler colonial decolonization lead to the construction of multiple states? The answer is no. Uh, I am not asking us to think about the proliferation of the state form. Um, look, that happened after the Second World War. The decolonization movement was understood as nothing but the multiplication of the state form. But the multiplication of the state form was also the reproduction of the same state form, the nation state. The answer is not to create a nation state of the Maori people or create a nation state of what have been defined as various Indian nations in North America. That's not the answer. Um, I argued that it's not really a two state solution. Two state can be read as three states or four or five or six or 10 states. But what we are talking of is to rethink the one state, the political community, to reorganize the political community from within. So that gives us a way to think between, think of the relationship between ideology and the construction of the state, not nation state, but state. Uh, and, and, and thus, thus the shift from nation state to a state which, as I, as I, as I totally admit, I, I'm, I'm not able to think through in greater detail than simply saying decouple the nation and the state. But to rethink that relationship is an epistemic challenge. Thank you. And this is a question from Yakani, who says, as per my observation, South Sudan is currently in a messy situation. Large tribes are dominating in politics, murdering and displacing minor tribes. What is the best way for small tribes, Troika and other groups need to do in order to stabilize South Sudan to become a functional nation? Well, I'm not sure that I have a solution for you. Um, <clears throat> there was the glimmer of a solution and that was John Grant's uh, vision of a new Sudan. You know, the SPLM had its greatest success not inside South Sudan. The SPLM had its greatest success 
in the border areas, in the Nuba Mountains, in South Kosovan, in all the border areas, in Darfur, in all the areas where it offered the hope of building a community which would not just turn cultural or tribal majorities into political majorities and minorities into political minorities. Now that glimmer of hope was extinguished with the murder of John Graham. Those who benefited from the murder are those that you call the large tribes contending for key positions in the South Sudan state. But I don't think the problem is that of large tribes oppressing small tribes. The problem needs to be thought of in, in other than the language of tribes. A fellow becomes a minister and decides to take stock of the people employed in his ministry or her ministry, which tribes they come from, proceeds by dismissing everybody from small tribes, then goes on to dismiss everybody that is not from his or her own tribe, and then to hire people from his or her own tribe. So how many people can he or she hire? Certainly not the whole tribe not even, this, even a significant minority. So for whom is this a solution? Let's say all these ministries became ministries of small tribes who organize. There would certainly not be a solution for most of the people belonging to the small tribes. So we have to redefine the issues. Um, I've tried to deal with this in some detail on the chapter on Sudan. Uh, but even if you read the chapter on Sudan, I do want to say in advance that you will not really find an answer to your question. Um, you may find a little bit of uh, brainstorming that may take you a step or two in a, in a direction which may be productive. Um, but I don't want to raise your hopes and <clears throat> lead you to where you get disillusioned with what you read. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, this next one is from Sam, and Sam says, many thanks, Professor Mamdani, for all your thought-provoking work. Working with the Nubian community in Kenya, I have followed your work for a long time. Could you please expand and clarify your most recent thoughts about what it would mean to decolonize identity? Do you imagine it to be just detribalization, i.e. the depoliticization of ethnicity, Kennedy's term, also Lonsdale? Or are you imagining something closer to a po post-ethnic state sorry, a post-ethnic society. In concrete terms, what would you see as the implications for state practices of classifying ethnic groups? For example, Uganda's constitutional list of ethnic groups, census classifications, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot in there. So I guess the first one is, what are your recent thoughts on, about what it would mean to decolonize identity? Is it just detribalization? Just. I would remove the word just. <laughs> Detribalization is a huge project. Um, and apparently a more difficult project than deracialization. 
because the colonial project of the colonial project has somehow succeeded in getting people to think that tribal identity is an eternal and a permanent identity. And the tribal identity is defined by custom, which is also eternal and permanent. And therefore, custom tribe is inherently African, inherently African. It doesn't change. I mean, it's remarkable. Custom is a social construct, right? It's a social construct in that if we want to think of custom in a long-term sense, it is society which creates custom as a consensus, as a social consensus. It is well known that there was no unitary state in Africa before colonialism. Those who work on custom tell us time and again that there was no single notion of custom overriding all of society. There were different customs. Customs of the marketplace were customs whose custodians were women in most places. Custom of the battlefield were custom whose custodians were age groups custom to do with land or customs whose custodians or clan leaders. There was no single customary authority who defined custom which was applicable in all domains of social life. With colonialism, custom ceased to be a social construct, a consensual construct. Custom became a state construct. Custom became customary law implemented by customary authorities. And that customary law became frozen as the timeless law of the tribe. So I'm asking us to rethink custom from a state construct back to a social construct. I'm asking us not to dissolve ethnic identity but to dissolve custodians of that ethnic identity, which were put in place by the colonial state. I'm asking us to recognize that ethnic identity is not frozen and permanent, but fluid. And that fluidity is the result of internal diversity and internal tension and internal contests, but not waged by force. Waged through persuasion, therefore consensual. The Nubian community in Kenya is a great example. I mean, historically, who are Nubians? 
not, not the Nubians who live in Northern Sudan, but the Nubians we think of as, as, as Nubians throughout Eastern Africa. The Nubians have a dual belonging. One is a tribal belonging. And the other is the belonging which we define as Nubian. Idi Amin, for example, came from a particular tribal community in West Nile, Uganda, but he was also Nubian. Nubian is more like Swahili. Though a Swahili, whether in East Africa or in Eastern Congo, the Swahili have a tribal community they come from. Originally, the Swahilis of the East African coast belong to six ethnic groups. And then the Swahili expanded to more and more ethnic groups. And the Swahili identity began as first and foremost a linguistic identity. The Nubian identity begins as a linguistic identity. The Nubian language, its rudiments are taken from Arabic. But Nubian like Swahili, and I believe, although I cannot prove it, but I believe this is true of all or most pre-colonial African ethnic identities. Swahili is an assim assimilationist identity. You can become in Swahili. My mother was in Swahili. You can become in Swahili. You can become a Nubian. But it's not only Swahili and Nubian. Think of the Amhara. You could become an Amhara. The Amhara identity expanded over time in Ethiopia. The Zulu identity expanded. You could become a Zulu. You could become a Baganda. The Baganda over time, the history of you, if you look at the history of Baganda clans, the original 14 clans are now 40 plus. Right? The identity expands because it's capable of, of absorbing. So I think when you talk of post-ethnic identity, I suspect that your understanding of ethnic is what ethnic became with colonialism, which is frozen groups with permanent boundaries, which do not assimilate, but they segregate. The nature of colonial society is to segregate. The nature of pre-colonial society is to assimilate. Thank you. We are out of time. Thank you so much, Thanks. Professor Mamdani. That was a really interesting and stimulating keynote and a question and answer. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for coming. It's great to have you. Um, do have a look at the other activities in the in the conference because there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, and we will say goodbye now. Thank you very much. I'm going to leave and uh, say a final thank you to all of you. Um, have a great conference. Thank you. I'll, I'll be seeing you Thursday afternoon, I guess. You will be seeing me Thursday afternoon and everybody else as well, because we do have a panel oh. talking about the book as well. <laughs>
So please That's do come right. along if you're interested in hearing more about the book, everybody. It'd be really great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye.